special box. And every time we buy an appliance or anything that comes with a user manual, we unwrap the item, place it in our house, and dump the user manual in a box, never to be seen of or heard from again. <laughs> Sounds like some people in this audience have a box just like that. This morning I asked Evan, my husband, I said, do you know, I don't know where that box is. I don't think I've seen that box for three years. So you can imagine my horror when one day I turned the corner in our laundry room to find water pouring out from underneath the washing machine. I'm freaking out. I'm starting to press every button possible, imaginal. This red error message is coming up and water continues to pour out, starting to flood the room and starting to go beyond. I'm trying frantically now at this point to press and nothing is happening. So I do the next best thing. I call my husband, Evan, on the phone. Now, if you don't know Evan, he's one of the most calm, collected, and helpful people on planet Earth. My poor husband, he's in the middle of his financial advising job, and I'm on the phone going, help me, I don't know how to make this thing stop. And within about 15 seconds, Evan has gone online, he's gone to the manufacturer's website, he's looked up the error code that I've given him, and he's told me exactly what button I need to press to make this machine stop. You know, I wonder how many people are walking around this earth never consulting the user manual for their life. How many people, even in this room, or, or maybe you're watching this online, have never stopped to ask God, our creator and maker, the question, what was I made for? When you dreamed me up, when you formed me in my mother's womb, what was I created to be? Too many people are lost not knowing this truth that God sees you as significantly profound to his plan for affecting his kingdom on earth. You know, a lot of times I challenge people to ask God this question. Just ask him this question. God, what was I made for? And some people might say, you know, I've asked him that question and I haven't heard the answer. When people say to me, I've tried to talk to God and he's not talking back, I often say this. I think that it's because God knows that you're not willing to do whatever he's going to ask you to do. So he's being gracious to you by keeping silent until you're ready. God desires the most fulfilled incredible life for you. If you've never heard the voice of God, if you don't have that real, alive, daily relationship with him, I encourage you, one thing from this conference that you would take, that you would go out to a place where you hear God, go, go, go somewhere where uh, you can get alone with him, just close the door like Daniel in your house and, and, and wrestle it out with God. The Bible says that if we seek God, we will find him. This is the first step to finding out your destiny. And whatever God says to you when you ask him, you say yes. You say this word in Hebrew, hineni. It means my answer is yes before you even ask the question. And when you hear God speak to you, whatever it is that he says, you do it. Now, oftentimes when that happens, you're going to enter this phase of purification. God starts removing from your life the things that are not pleasing to him, the things that are not from him in your life. And that can be painful. And a lot of people in that moment, they shrink back. They stop going after the plans and purposes of God for their life. But I want to tell you that there's a principle of power and purity. They are linked in the word of God. Joshua 3, 5, the people of Israel are about to walk into the promised land. They've spent 40 years wandering around with their problems in the desert. It's now time to go and face the giants and take over the land of their inheritance, all the promises of God. And Joshua says to them, be sanctified, for tomorrow God will do great wonders among you. First, Second Chronicles 16, 9, 
It says the eyes of the Lord are searching through the land. God is actively looking through the land for people who have an undivided, a whole, a pure heart towards him. Why? So that he can show himself mighty on their behalf. Once you submit yourself to this process that God wants to do in your life, once he, he forms you, transforms you, he will send you out to reach the lost and dying world, to impact the people around you, clothed with his might and power. You know, one of the most tragic people in the Bible is King Saul. King Saul had the advantage of knowing what his destiny is. When the prophet Samuel comes and anoints him, Samuel tells him, your destiny is to be king in Israel and to be a deliverer, to deliver the people from their enemies. And Saul believes that truth for a while. And then at a certain point, he begins to value the opinions of man, the favor of people over what God said. And by the end, Saul finds himself prostrate in front of a witch trying to work through divination to sort out the problems that he's facing, and he loses the position of being king. Let me show you what that looks like in our life. Anybody here like lemonade? Yeah. Sprite. Do you like Sprite? Imagine this. Is your perfect God will, your destiny in life, do you see how beautiful and pure it is? Mmm. It tastes good. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Amen? Amen. Mm. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Amen? Amen. The Lord is for me. Who can stand against me? Mm. Anybody here like coffee? Imagine this to be all the other voices. I need to find favor with my friends. Mm. I need to get ahead at work. I have a mortgage to pay. I'm scared that people won't like me, so I'm going to compromise over here the word of God so I can find favor with men. The truth of the Bible is always forever that God is good and he's merciful. Amen? My buddy at work, he's got this business idea and I'm going to go over here with him and I'm going to invest all my savings with him. Pretty soon this is what our life starts looking like. You know, the Bible says that Elijah was a man just like us, James 5, 17. Elijah is an example of a man who's walking out his calling and his destiny to its fullest. When we find Elijah at the beginning, he says he's confronting King Ahab, and he's calling the people of Israel back to uh, God. The nation needs to repent. And he says to King Ahab, repent. Because the God before whom I stand has told you to do that. And if you don't do that, there will not be rain for three years. So we know that Elijah knew the manifest presence of God. He had that daily alive relationship where he could say to God and God would say back to him. The next thing that happens after Elijah has this confrontation is that he's sent to the brook away from everybody. He's hidden for almost three years. Maybe that's you before you arrived at this conference standing at the kitchen sink going, God, what happened to my successful televangelism ministry? I thought I was doing good. Elijah is sitting by that brook day in, day out and being washed and transformed by the water 
of the word of God. All the while, by the way, God is providing for Elijah. There are ravens that are bringing steak. Now, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian in the house today, I can't help you with that verse. <laughs> After almost three years, the brook dries up. Elijah doesn't complain. Listen, he goes off to another city, Zarephath. Now, this is what's interesting about reading your Bible in Hebrew. Anybody know the name of that brook? It's Cherith. And Cherith comes from the Hebrew word krit. And krit means to cut off. Or actually, it's a much more violent expression. It means to amputate. But when God calls Elijah to Zarephath, Zarephath in Hebrew means refinement. So it turns out that after purification, there's even another greater season of refinement. At the end of that season, by the way, all the while, God has Elijah with a widow and her son, and he's multiplying the flour, and this woman is making him cake every day. So if you're a sugar phobe in the house tonight, I can't help you with that verse either. <laughs> At the end of that season of time, the widow's son dies, and Elijah takes this young boy up to the room, and he stretches his body over him, and he breathes the Holy Spirit power into this young, dead, lifeless body. And this boy is brought back to life. After that, it's time for Elijah to return back to Mount Carmel for that holy showdown we all know about. Elijah prays, and God answers him by fire. He kills 450 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And then he hears that Isabel, the wife of Ahab, is so angry that she has said that she's going to kill Elijah, and Elijah runs away. Because it turns out that God can stop rain, rain down fire from heaven, raise a kid to life, and multiply food, steak, and cake, but he can't deal with one woman. Now, Elijah is making his way down to Mount Horeb, and he is tired. He's spent. He, he's, he's given it all. And, and he falls asleep, and an angel wakes him up with this meal of water and cake. I, I think it's specifically there to remind Elijah. Do you remember the water of the brook? Do you remember that time of purification? Do you remember the cake of the widow? And the power of the Holy Spirit in you to raise that child back to life. And he exhorts him to keep going. God meets Elijah in Mount Horeb and calls him to impact the next generation. Listen, if you're here tonight and you think you're a has-been or you're tired or you're done, God has a whole other generation for you to impact for his kingdom in this country, in this nation. Now let me tell you, let me share with you what this process that I've just described to you looks like in my own life. When I was a young child, I had this picture, this vision, this dream of, of singing and, and worshiping with multitudes of people. But things happened to me when I was a little girl in a recording studio that should never happen to a little girl. And I left this dream that God had over my life and I entered into a professional uh, career in business. I was very successful. I was very happy. But God is more committed, listen, to the purposes and plans and destinies that he has spoken over our life than even we are. And he interrupted my life, and he called me back to worshiping him. I stood atop Mount Carmel, that place where Elijah called down fire and then later God opened the heavens and rained down his showers of blessing on the nation and worshiped God. God started to give me songs. He, he gave me albums. He opened doors. I started flying all around the world, sharing with the people of God. He worked inside my life, changing me and transforming me as I week after week stood up atop Mount Carmel alone, worshiping the Lord. And then several years ago, I sustained a hearing injury. 
It's been so debilitating. I've been working through and walking through a great season of pain and suffering. And God challenged me, and I understood that even in this season of my life, my identity had gotten tied up with what I was doing. And finally, falling to my knees, I said, God, I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what you want to do. Tell me what it is. Hineni, my answer is yes, before you even ask the question. And God said, would you, a young Israeli woman, go to the sons and daughters of Ishmael and call them back to the father's house? Would you reach out to a people who would never expect the message of Yeshua to come from this vessel? And God has opened up doors of opportunities. He has made connections, divine connections for me and given me a whole other perspective about what he's doing in the Middle East and what he's doing in the world right now. My brothers and sisters, God loves you so much. He desires for you to live the fullness of the bounty that he has for your life. Now, if you're here tonight and this is stirring in your heart in any way, if you feel the work of the Holy Spirit, I'd just like to ask you, just want to pray for you in these last few moments to bow your head, close your eyes, and just lift your hands in a posture of receiving. I'm just going to pray. Abba, Father, thank you so much for your children. Thank you for every heart that is open, for every heart that wants to hear your voice, that wants to do your will. Lord God, I pray you would clothe them with power from and high, that you would fill them with courage and bravery to do your will, to take on whatever it is, to go wherever you say to go, to say whatever it is you say to say. Lord, send them to impact this nation, their neighbors, their family, their long-lost ones, whatever it is, wherever it is. Thank you, Lord, that your perfect purpose is wonderful and good in our eyes. We say to you tonight, Hineni, my answer is yes, before you even ask the question. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.